Hello, Pokemon fans! My name's Leader Fuzzy, and I love this weather. Welcome to Poke Aquarium, where I observe a marine Pokemon of some sort and figure out what it's based on. I'll focus on different aspects that highlight the creature and help to give context to its inspiration. Today, I'd like to bring attention to a Pokemon that I've always loved, but isn't talked about very much these days. Clampearl's evolution, Huntail. One of my favorite Pokemon for my favorite region. But first, let's head inside. It's getting a bit damp out here. Huntail is a blue and orange eel Pokemon that evolves from the bivalve Pokemon Clampearl, if traded while holding the Deep Sea Tooth. If Clampearl is traded while holding the Deep Sea Scale, it becomes Gorbis. This evolution family is very interesting, as all three of these designs take inspiration from a variety of marine creatures, but we'll only be focusing on Huntail for today. Now, Huntail is known as a Deep Sea Pokemon, and it is known to live deep in the pitch dark sea. So before we get started, I'd like to give some information on the area where this creature would reside. The water column, the vertical open part of the ocean from the surface to the sediment, is divided into three general sections consisting of varying levels of light. The first and smallest, the euphotic zone, is defined as the area with enough light where photosynthesis can occur. This section is where many of the creatures we are familiar with reside, such as corals and the tropical fish that live in and around them. Occurring at a depth of 0 to 200 meters, depending on turbidity, the photosynthetic creatures that live here, such as algae and seaweed, provide a stable base of the food web for all other organisms to work off of. The slightly larger area below the euphotic zone is known as the dysphotic zone, the area of the water column that has light but does not have enough for photosynthetic creatures to undergo photosynthesis and produce a net gain of energy, occurring at a depth of around 200 to 1000 meters. This section of the ocean is often eerily dubbed the Twilight Zone, due to it always occurring between light and total darkness. You're traveling to another dimension. Finally, the largest area of the water column is known as the Aphotic Zone, which is defined as the area of the ocean where no light penetrates. Often occurring at a depth of 1,000 to 10,994 meters, but the average depth of the ocean is around 4,000 meters, this is the area that Huntail likely resides in. The use of the word deep in Huntail's HeartGold SoulSilver Dex entry suggests that Huntail lives predominantly in the aphotic zone, and spends little time, if at all, in the dysphotic zone. This is further confirmed by the X entry. It lives deep in the sea where no light ever filters down. This wording can only mean one thing. Huntail lives predominantly in the largest habitat on Earth, the aphotic zone. I have a deep fascination with this part of the ocean, so I'd love to share that with you today. The creatures there may seem different and intimidating, but they're not alien. There's plenty to learn from them and definitely plenty left to discover. So let's start with the Pokemon Huntail is based off of, the Gulper Eel. Otherwise known as the Pelican Eel or Uripharynx Pelicanides, these guys are often cited as one of the strangest creatures in the deep sea, and are referenced in a variety of ways in modern media. So let's learn something about them. Maybe then they'll become a little less alien and a little more familiar. Culprit eels can be found in the deeper areas of the dysphotic zone, at around 500 to 3000 meters. This includes parts of both the dysphotic and the aphotic zone, so it varies a bit from where Huntail resides. Even though the depths at which Huntail and the Gulper eel can be found may be a bit different, overall the depth at which they occur is fairly accurate, considering they can both be found under 1000 meters in the aphotic zone. In addition, X's dex entry only implies that Huntail lives in the aphotic zone, meaning it could very well travel to the dysphotic zone if it needed to, much like the Gulper Eel. Either way, the depth that Huntail and the Gulper Eel can be found is fairly similar, giving proof that Huntail may be based off of this creature. So both Huntail and the Gulper Eel make their homes in the part of the ocean that would be extremely difficult for humans to exist in, let alone live in. The area where these creatures reside in exerts 4,400 pounds per square inch of pressure which essentially feels like being crushed by a good-sized car on all sides. So, how does the Gulbriol survive in such conditions? Well, many deep-sea creatures are able to survive the immense pressure due to a few biological factors. First, the Gulbriol, or any other deep-sea creature for that matter, does not exhibit any air pockets such as lungs or swim bladders. Since the pressure of the water is so great at these depths compared to empty air, any air pockets a creature would have would collapse almost immediately. So if a creature would want to live in the deep sea, air pockets such as these would not be evolutionarily beneficial. In addition, many deep sea creatures, the Gulper Eel included, have soft bodies that are capable of withstanding high amounts of pressure. Other examples of soft body deep sea organisms include the giant squid, and Adarians such as the common jellyfish or the giant siphonophore. In addition, despite the fact that I have referred to them as such so far, Gulper Eels are not true eels. Both Gulper Eels and true eels are in the class of ray fin fishes, 
but gulber eels diverge into an order entirely separate from true eels, known as sacopharyngiforms, with the largest difference coming from the lack of scales, pelvic fins, and swim bladders. Because most organisms of this order live in the deep sea, and therefore cannot have swim bladders due to immense pressure. Now, let's move on to the most defining feature that both Huntail and the gulber eel share, the mouth. Huntail's dex entries often cite how it is able to use its mouth to hunt prey, in particular mentioning how it swallows its prey whole, then swallows the prey whole with its large gaping mouth. Similar to Huntail, the gulber eel has a very large mouth, as its name suggests, and is one of the primary reasons that this creature is seen as odd compared to other marine organisms. This mouth is loosely hinged and very flexible, so it can easily open wide enough to eat prey several times larger than itself. The gulper eel also has a stomach that can stretch and expand to accommodate these large meals. Despite this, however, the teeth it possesses are very small, suggesting that these features are used to capture and trap prey rather than rip them apart. Yet another feature that makes the gulper eel stand out are its small eyes, which makes the creature look quite ominous. The size of the mouth would make the eyes look smaller by default, but it turns out the gulper eel has abnormally small eyes, even for creatures in the aphotic zone. Most creatures that live at these extreme depths in the aphotic zone either go all or nothing with their eyes. Some creatures have huge eyes to detect any source of light in the dark depths, while others don't deem it evolutionarily necessary, and thus opt for smaller eyes or no eyes at all. Many creatures that lack true eyes have simple eye spots that detect light intensity and move towards brighter areas. In addition, many organisms, in the deep sea or otherwise, often do not rely on color but instead brightness. The gulper eel is on the smaller side of the deep sea eye spectrum, and seems to only use it for detecting faint light figures and brightness, rather than compose images. It seems that only brightness is important to the gulper eel, likely so it can seek out and drift towards unsuspecting prey. In terms of length, Huntail is about 5 feet long, while an adult gulper eel can grow to 2.5 feet in length. This difference in size is quite unusual, but it may exist as a means to make Huntail more similar to its branching evolution Gorbis, which is almost 6 feet long, rather than relate it to the gulper eel. The only other aspect where Huntail and the gulper eel differ drastically is in the color. Huntail's main colors include light blue and orange. This is in heavy contrast to the gulper eel, which while often depicted as completely black, is actually more of a dark brown, similar to many other deep sea creatures. This difference in color is not easily fixed in Huntail's shiny form, where it is shown to be a bright green and orange. Personally, I would have preferred if Huntail's shiny form was more of a darker brown or black to look more similar to the Gulper Eel. But the overall design of the Pokémon is very nice, so I can't complain. Although, it seems like Huntail's color in its early beta designs suggested it was originally intended to look much more like the Gulper Eel than it ended up being. In the beta leak of Gold and Silver that happened recently, a water steel type Pokémon that highly resembles Huntail, known as Grotes, or Gorotesu, was revealed. And this design has a tighter tie to the Gulper Eel than Huntail does. The color and mouth are on point when compared to the gulper eel, but the lore on its head is more akin to the classic female anglerfish, and was likely the inspiration to create Lantern. Its fins also resemble the fins on Huntail's mouth to a T. This beta Pokemon's design makes it clear that they wanted a Pokemon that was based off of a deep sea creature in gold and silver, but ended up making Chinchou and Lantern instead to resemble the much more iconic female anglerfish, and save this design for the next generation, where they retroactively incorporated it into Huntail's design. The fin on Huntail's head seems to be the only aspect of its design that is not directly based off of the Gulper Eel, but instead seems to be taken from another infamous deep sea creature. Ultramoon's Dex entry states that, according to tradition, when Huntail wash up on shore, something unfortunate will happen. There was an ancient legend that told of a sea serpent washing ashore on a beach in Bermuda, predicting a horrible event was to happen soon. An event that soon followed this was an earthquake, and due to this, fish washing ashore was said to be a sign of an upcoming earthquake or natural disaster. This legend has seen many iterations in the Pokémon series, the most notable of which being Whiskash, a catfish with the ability to create earthquakes. What's interesting is that this legend has some truth to it. Not in the sense that dead fish washing ashore has anything to do with earthquakes, but it turns out the sea serpent referenced in the ancient legend is actually real. Say hello to the Oarfish, a deep sea dwelling boned fish known for their incredible size of up to 11 meters, and magnificent red dorsal fin. Aside from the gulper eel, it is possible that the Oarfish influenced Huntail's design a bit with its prominent fin emerging from its head, and the fact that the Oarfish is also a well known deep sea dwelling organism. However, unlike Huntail, the Oarfish is incapable of eating prey much larger than itself, and instead feeds on zooplankton such as copepods and other small crustaceans. 
The Gulpiril definitely serves as more of an inspiration to Huntail than the Orphish does, but it's important to mention, as both creatures are equally fascinating. In any case, this would explain the Dex entry in Ultra Moon, relating Huntail to the Sea Serpents of Tradition. Returning back to the Gulper Yell, let's talk about its behavior, and how it may not be as aggressive as it looks. Despite its threatening look, if you were to somehow encounter the Gulper Yell in its natural habitat, without first being crushed by the immense pressure, you wouldn't have to worry about the Gulper Yell lunging out to attack you. These creatures are actually very inactive, often not moving for hours on end, simply drifting in the depths with their gaping maw open. But why would a creature that is capable of swallowing prey several times the size of itself choose not to actively hunt down anything it sees with its tiny little eyes? The simple answer would be to conserve energy. You see, despite how well equipped for it it is, the Gulper Yield does not encounter large meals all that often, due to life in the dysphotic and aphotic zones being incredibly sparse. Instead, its mouth functions as a net of sorts, scooping up any creature, big or small, and using its sustenance for itself. In fact, it seems that most of the Gulper Eel's diet consists of schools of smaller crustaceans such as shrimp and copepods, rather than larger fish or invertebrates. The Gulper Eel will continually drift in the dark while scooping up anything it can with its enormous mouth. If it ever sees any flashing lights in the deep sea, it will not lunge at it at great speeds, but instead will sneakily drift in its direction, and hope the bright prey will end up in its mouth somehow. If it succeeds, the eel's mouth will shut, but if the prey escapes before it is able to, it won't lose sleep over it which is good because it doesn't sleep. Being a creature that dwells in the deep sea, the only light it will ever encounter in its natural habitat would be bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is the process by which living organisms create artificial light, and it is extremely common in deep sea dwelling organisms. These deep sea creatures use bioluminescence in a variety of ways, including, but not limited to, the mating rituals of a firefly squid, the sudden glow of unseen plankton in the water, and the beautiful array of colors found in the cilia of comb jellies. I believe bioluminescence is one of the most stunning and beautiful aspects of living organisms, which is emphasized by the fact that it becomes more common the deeper into the ocean you go. In a study focusing on the ratio of bioluminescence, it was found that 76% of deep sea creatures exhibit bioluminescence in one form or another. The most common bioluminescent creature found in this study was actually hydromedusae, a simpler relative of the jellyfish. They're in the same phylum, nadarians leading the rate of bioluminescence in sampled organisms at 100%. Other organisms with high rates of bioluminescence in this study included siphonophores, tenophores, otherwise known as comb jellies, and cephalopods. Fishes, the category of the study that the gulper eels fit into, were found to be around 54% bioluminescent. So among this group, bioluminescence is fairly uncommon. This, however, does not mean that it is underutilized by deep sea dwelling fish. You see, in the dark depths of the ocean, the main survival strategy is to see, but not be seen. Many bioluminescent fish employ this strategy in the deep sea, such as the stoplight eel, the marine hatchet fish, and the flashlight fish using bioluminescence to escape or locate prey. However, the way the gulper eel exhibits bioluminescence seems to be much different from other bioluminescent fish. Another trait that links Huntail and the gulper eel is the bioluminescent tip at the end of their tail. As you can see, both creatures exhibit a very prominent bioluminescent spot at the end of their tail. This is the trait that convinced me that Huntail must be based primarily off of the Gulper Eel. But the most interesting part of this connection, to me, is that there's no explanation for it to exist. You see, evolutionarily, there's no explanation as to why the Gulper Eel isolates this unique trait to the end of its tail. Bioluminescence is used by deep sea dwelling organisms in a variety of ways, but the most iconic example is without a doubt as a lure. I'm sure you've seen the example of a small, shiny, bright thing attracting a creature, only for them to figure out that that small, shiny, bright thing is attached to a very hungry predator, usually a female anglerfish. It is without a doubt the most iconic use of bioluminescence as a means to obtain food. It goes back to the previous survival strategy of seeing, but not being seen. Having a lure right in front of your mouth that unsuspecting prey will mistake as a source of food makes it easy for that creature to eat the prey in one swift motion. Huntail seems to exhibit this behavior as well, with many Pokédex entries stating that it weighs around its tail to attract prey. Thus, the Gulpriol must use its bioluminescent tail in a similar fashion, right? Well, actually this may not be the case. As previously stated, the Gulpriol does not actively search for food. Instead, it opts to simply open its mouth and wait for a substantial creature, dead or alive, small or large, to end up inside. This is because food is not a common occurrence deep in the ocean. For contrast, in the flourishing area of the euphotic zone, small fish and predators actively chase each other, often using great amounts of energy to escape or catch one another. 
This is made possible by the large amount of food found in these areas. Photosynthetic algae and plankton feed the prey, and there are plenty of prey organisms to feed the predators. The deep part of the aphotic zone does not have these luxuries. The most consistent source of food comes in the form of marine snow, which consists of discarded parts of both alive and dead organisms that float down into the depths. Deep sea creatures feed on this marine snow, but it can be difficult to find any other source of food. Thus, most deep sea creatures try to conserve as much energy as possible, and this often results in organisms not moving and instead waiting for prey to come to them. This can be seen in creatures such as the vampire squid or the giant siphonophore. In most cases, these creatures move very little, if at all, the only exception being when they spot prey, because as previously stated, food is very hard to come by. In addition, deep sea creatures are often much smaller than you would think, except for the giant siphonophore, those guys are huge as larger creatures require more food to stay alive. Thus, the Gulpriol's mouth staying wide open as it waits for food to end up inside is a brilliant survival strategy. It doesn't use much energy, and the size of its mouth means that something is bound to end up inside, whether that be a full-sized fish or a planktonic crustacean. So where does this bioluminescent tail come into play? One would think that it is used to attract prey to its gaping maw, but how is this activity energy efficient in the environment of the deep sea if this lure isn't right in front of its mouth at all times, like the female anglerfish? The bioluminescent tip that the gulper eel possesses is on the other side of the creature entirely, so unless the tail somehow ends up in front of the mouth when its body is twisted around, this lure cannot be used effectively at all times. Thus, due to the gulper eel residing in an area that is not conducive to regular study, it is unknown why this trait has been part of the creature for so long. Perhaps this trait of the gulper eel has evolutionarily persisted due to its occasional usefulness when it ends up in front of the mouth, but it's hard to be sure, as no conclusive study has been made about the purpose of this bioluminescent tail. That wouldn't stop Huntail from interpreting this unique trait though. Due to the energetic and aggressive nature seen in this Pokemon, Huntail may represent what the gulper eel would theoretically act like in an environment with enough prey and energy to enable it to use its tail as a lure consistently. With enough available energy, I'm sure the Gulper Eel could become an aggressive and energetic hunter. And Huntail seems to capture the idea of a creature like this perfectly. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to thank anyone who let me use their art in this video. You can find links to their websites in the description. If you'd like to see more Poke Aquarium videos, you can check out this playlist. In particular, I'd recommend watching the videos on Marini and Crab Brawler. I really appreciate the support I've been getting from everyone. It's inspiring me to think of more and more ideas for future episodes, so you can bet there will be more. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.